Hello and welcome to Scripture Untangled, a podcast by the Canadian Bible Society. My name is Joanna LaFleur. I'm a friend of the Canadian Bible Society, and I'm going to be your guide for today's episode. Today's guest is Cardinal Lacroix, interviewed by Andrew Sterling. His eminence, Cardinal Gérald C. Cardinal Lacroix, was born in the province of Quebec, but his studies, his work, and his life, and his missionary service to the church has taken him to the United States, as well as many years spent as a missionary in Colombia and beyond, traveling the world with various honorable appointments and titles in the Catholic Church. He is the Archbishop of Quebec and the Primate of Canada since his appointment by Pope Benedict on the 22nd of February, 2011. He was the Cardinal since February, 2014. He was also previously the Auxiliary Bishop of Quebec. So enjoy this fascinating conversation between Cardinal Lacroix and Canadian Bible Society Ambassador, Reverend Dr. Andrew Sterling. Well, Your Eminence, it's a great privilege for me to be able to spend some time with you discussing the place of the Bible in your own life and in the life of the church. And in October of last year, you graciously hosted the leadership team of the Canadian Bible Society at your office in Quebec City. And for all of us who were there, it was a memorable conversation and particularly outstanding was your own story of how the Bible has shaped your life in its early stages and in your formative years. Can you share with this audience how the Bible shaped and formed your life from your earliest days? Yes, well, thank you. It's always a joy to share how the Lord works in our lives and how he reaches us at the stage we're at, where we're at, and reveals himself. And the word of God is is revelation. It's his revelation of his presence in the whole history of salvation and how he continues to real, reveal himself to us today. Uh, I was born here in the province of Quebec in a very small farming town. And my father was a lumberjack. But when I was eight years old, we were already five children. I'm the oldest of, of seven now. but And uh, we immigrated to New England, Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, that is uh, where really I began to open up and discover a new world. And that's when I started discovering the word of God. First in school, I went to a Catholic school, grammar school. And I remember in fourth grade, uh, they offered us a Bible, St. Joseph's edition of the Catholic Bible. Well, the Bible is not Catholic, but it's a Catholic translation with with notes and everything. (laughs) And, uh, wow, I remember how precious. I still have that Bible. Uh, I would read once in a while in it. But I would say that it was when I was 10 years old is where really I fell in love with the Word of God. My parents did a weekend, a weekend they called in French La Rencontre, which means the encounter. It's a weekend like a revival experience where lay people and priests would give their witnessing some talks. They'd preach the word of God. And they came out of that weekend with a personal encounter of the Lord, and they came home with a New Testament, my mom and dad. And on top of that, they were invited to join a small uh, gospel sharing group every week, one night a week, with other people. There were maybe seven or eight in in their group, people like them who had experienced the weekend with a leader who had more experience. And that is where every week they would share the gospel text of the upcoming Sunday. I watched my parents bloom out of that experience. Their relationship changed between both of them. And with us, with the children, it just changed our family life. Now we were church goers. We went to mass regularly every Sunday morning as a family, but Opening up to the Word of God brought something new in our lives. And I started looking into the Bible even more. And in the New Testament, the Gospel, the letters of St. Paul, and oh, I'd find treasures. I'd, I'd have I'd had uh, my, my own Bible that I would underline. And uh, it just spoke to me. I enjoyed that so much. And seeing my parents grow. As I was the oldest of the family... When the meeting, the sharing group meeting was in my, in our house, it'd go from house to house every week. But when it was in our home, being the oldest, I was 10, 11 after, 
I would have the opportunity, the permission to stay up for the first part of the meeting where they would sing, they would greet each other and start sharing the gospel. And come a time, my dad would say, okay, Jerry, time to go to bed. You got school tomorrow. But that stunned me and surprised me and rejoiced me to see these workers, uh, these other families like ours, uh, share the word of God and discover how it was meaningful to their lives. So my dad and my mom have been doing that since the month of August, 1967. How many years is that? It's over 50 years. Isn't that something? Every week, and they continue. They're going to be celebrating 67 years of marriage this summer. And they continue every week or so to share. The groups have changed. People have moved away or passed on. But they, they find other people. They continue sharing. It's been such a, a nourishment for their lives. Sharing the word of God with others is re- a real blessing because it creates relationships between people who share not only the gospel but their lives because the gospel speaks to our lives, our everyday lives. It nurtures a relationship with the Lord, a personal and then a community community relationship. So I grew in that, you know, uh, uh, throughout the years, and that has been that's where it all started for me. And now I have I have with me always my little red Bible because I do believe the Bible should be read. <laughs> oh, 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 oh my! <laughs> <laughs> That's what they call a quotable quote, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I did invent that. My, my colleague from Toronto, Cardinal Thomas Collins, I, I heard him oh, yeah. say that once in a, little, in a talk. So I says, I'm going to use that uh, with uh, Dr. Sterling. <laughs> it sounds like Thomas, for sure. <laughs> yes. Has, yes, with, yes. This, with this deep richness that you have, which you, you've articulated beautifully, is there a, a, do you have what I call a life verse or a particular passage of scripture that arose out of all of this that has really sort of informed or shaped your life? Um, mm. Is there such a thing or is it it's sort of more general as well? I would say uh, there are three books of the Bible that really always speak to me so, so much. First, the Gospels, the four the four evangelists account of their meeting the Lord or speaking about him, witnessing about his death and resurrection, his life, his teachings, his miracles, parables. That is always very, very good to me. The letters of St. Paul are also, and St. Peter, the, the, those New Testament letters are very, and the Psalms, you know, we, we pray with the Psalms uh, every day and many times a day uh, with the divine office. And that is so nourishing because it puts in your in your heart and on your lips some words that help you speak to the Lord and express what you're living. Sometimes there are psalms of thanksgiving, and it helps you really address the Lord with gratitude and thanksgiving. Sometimes there are psalms of trial, tribulation, of persecution. You're going through that sometimes, and it helps you turn to the Lord with what you're living. Sometimes the psalm that's there for today's uh, time of prayer is exactly the contrary of what you're experiencing, you know? It's a psalm of thanksgiving, of joy, rejoicing, and you're going through a time of trial. We say, well, this isn't with me. No, but you know what? There's somebody else who's in trial at this moment. Somebody else who's in joy at this moment. It may be not what you're living, but it opens you up to think and pray for others. So the Psalms are very, very important. But I'd say if there's one text that's accompanied me for years and years and years, I would say it would be the disciples of Emmaus. Luke 24, verses 13 to 35. Jesus, who on the afternoon of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, goes up and meets up with Cleophas and the other disciple who are discouraged, and he walks with them. He comes close to them, asks a question, listens, and then reveals everything pertaining to him in the history of salvation. And and then uh, he makes believe or tries to leave them, and they say, stay with us, Lord. Stay with us, Lord. 
Stay with us, Lord, is my Episcopal motto that I put on my coat of arms. Stay with us, Lord. Huh? Like another apostle said, to whom will, shall we turn to? You have the words of eternal life. Huh? So, uh, and he stays with them. He accepts to stay with them. And at the breaking of the bread, their eyes open, they recognize him. And then they go back and witness. I think that's the, that's the recipe for evangelization doing what Jesus did with the disciples of Emmaus, uh, going to them, walking, listening a long time before you talk. Jesus doesn't start talking. He starts listening and walking with people. And then he reveals, and he doesn't impose himself. When you give people the truth with love, and you love them in truth, they want more. Stay with us, they will say. And then we continue journeying. So that is the text that I've, I've maybe given over 500 conferences, talks on that subject and shared it. And I continue to be amazed and discover the beauty of that text, you know? It, it's mm. also, I mean, I, I mean, first of all, I, I share completely your love of that text. And uh, it, it is also an affirmation in a sense of word and sacrament. I mean, it is Jesus opening up the word to them and then the breaking of the bread. I mean, it, 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 it is both the word, but then demonstrated in the fellowship of the table and how powerful an image that is for, for all of yeah. us, really, in our yeah. walk with the Lord. Um, yeah. on, a, on a sort of a, a talking now more sort of at a church level, I mean, since mm -hmm. the Second Vatican Council, and especially Dea Verbum, where sort of ease of access to the Bible and the encouragement to the faithful to have a love of Scripture were really advocated strongly, what changes have you seen as a cardinal in the role of the Bible in the life of the Church, and how would you like to see that sort of expanded in the years to come? Mm. Well, that's a very, very important question, Dr. Sterling. Very important because we cannot advance and live our Christian life, our community life, if at the center of that life it is not the Word of God. We need the Word of God. And the Bible, the Bible is the, the it's more than a tool. It's the, the living Word of God. We need to come to Him and enter into that dialogue with the Lord. What I've seen, what I expressed to you when I was very young and saw my parents get into this sharing of the Bible, uh, I've been doing this all my life now. Uh, I joined a secular institute with lay people and priests who do that every week also. When I became a bishop and then an archbishop here in Quebec, I decided to invite all my brothers and sisters in the different committees of our diocese, and when we go on visitations and parishes and meet groups, catechists, evangelists, people who work on financial committees, we start almost all our meetings with the sharing of the Word of God. 20 minutes, 25, 30 minutes. Uh, I tell them, you know, if uh, usually it's about 20 minutes we take. We take a text and we share it. Unless we have a big agenda, you know, then we take 30 minutes. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> they laugh. I say, yes, it's because we have advantage in coming to the Lord and listening to his word because it brings us together to listen to God's word, to listen to each other and how that word falls into our lives and inspires us. It's the word we, he we read, we proclaim that we listen. It's the word that comes into our heart. It's the word shared with others, which is living word also. The Lord speaks through his Holy Spirit to all of us, and we listen to each other. What's the good news you discover in this text? You know, it's not a Bible study, although that's important and we need that. It's not a Bible discussion. That's also important, and we have that too. This is just sharing. We share what the Lord is revealing to us, how this comes into my life and what is it inviting me to become, to do, to, and, and so we share that. And then we end, we proclaim the text three times. It's a sort of a, a modified, simplified version of Lexio Divina, which is a very traditional in the church to meditate the word of God. Oftentimes it's done alone, but we do it in groups. And after the third proclamation, we invite to a time of prayer. 
we've heard the Lord speak to us. Now, what would we like to tell him? What would we like to say to him? It's our turn to talk to him. And we always do a first part of that in silence. I speak to my Lord in silence, in the secret of my heart. And then we open it up for if you want, if you, would you like to share the prayer? What do you want to tell the Lord after hearing this text of the gospel or a letter of St. Paul or the Psalm or whatever book? And it's beautiful. It's so enriching to, to listen. So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, we've got over 200 small groups right now in our diocese of Quebec that share the gospel every week or every other week. They do it uh, like we're doing it now in a virtual way for some of them because the distances are too far. And sometimes they do it, uh, they, they'll be in the living room or on a, a kitchen table. or uh, And it's a wonderful way to have small cells of people who not only listen to the Word of God, but listen to each other and support each other. The Word of God brings us together as a community. And it also sends us out. These are not little groups that become ghettos. These are little groups that make us missionary disciples. You cannot listen to the word of God without having it change your life. I remember one day in the group I, I, I belong to, one man is a businessman. He has many employees and he, he comes in one night for a meeting and he says, you know, after what we read last week, what I discovered in the gospel, I could not be the same with my employees. I had to change my ways of doing. The Lord is teaching me. Now, we didn't moralize him. We didn't tell him you got to do this and change that and stop. No, the Lord spoke to him and through others, and he decided he needed to change. The gospel converts us because it brings us into a relationship, not with a book, with someone, Jesus Christ. I know your, your question was bigger than that. This is my diocese. But we're trying to do that also in the Episcopal conferences and our meetings of bishops in Rome. Uh, every time we have a big meeting now, we have the we come in procession with the Bible, with the Word of God, and we we sing, we we proclaim all our plenary assemblies of the Catholic bishops of Canada. We always come in with a procession. We sing, asking the Holy Spirit that His Word might guide us, and we put it in a very prominent place with uh, with a beautiful candle because He is the light of the world. With flowers because it's important. And uh, and uh, we we bow down before the word of God. So slowly, this is becoming more and more. You know, since the Vatican Council, there have been many many tools to help us. The, the 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 Bible Society has helped us in so many ways, and many many other uh, scripture uh, scholars and people who've helped us, giving us tools to learn more and to to, to study, to discuss, to 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 read, to be able to understand better. Uh, and uh, that's been a big, big help. Yeah. And also the, uh, the Synod on the Word of God in 2008 was a very, very important step to say we've come a long way since Vatican II, but we've got, still got a long ways to go. So we continue to, to find ways to share the, the gospel, to share the Word of God and, uh, you know, I, I always say this to the people when I meet them. The Bible is this year again, the best sold book in the world. Did you know that? People say, no, it's just, nobody thinks that. In all the languages, it's not on the bestseller list because it'd be number one everywhere. It's the best seller of all times. And yes, it's the less read. A lot of people have Bibles in their homes, beautiful Bibles with gold around and beautiful photo images and, and paintings, but they don't read it. They have it. Sometimes it's in a beautiful box, someplace in a drawer. They take it out for special times. But this is a book to be with you every day of your life. You know, we need to feed on this every day, all the time. Yeah. The Pope always has his little New Testament in his pocket. Yeah, when I travel, I always have a little one too that I always bring with me. Anywhere, you can just open it and read a, a little bit of scripture. And uh, yeah, it's important. Yeah.
it, and I, I love to hear the way that you're talking about the Bible as sort of as a living word, a word that that engages us, a book that reads us, a book that 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 challenges us. And many years yeah. ago, I mean, just anecdotally, I was fortunate to visit Roman Catholic leaders in Santiago, Chile. And uh, I sat down with a, a prominent Jesuit thinker called Jose Aldenate, and we spent two hours together talking about the days of the Pinochet era and all of those kinds of difficult moments. And he, like the, the current Pope, pulled out his little New Testament and uh, he started quoting it to me and was saying, look, this has been my impetus. This has given me the energy, the power, the instruction. Um, it has given me the direction. And even though there were moments in his life where he had to be extremely courageous, uh, he felt that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit speaking through the living word enabled him to do what he was able to do. So you're, 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 you're right in your assessment, I think, and I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that. I'd like to just turn the page a little bit into something different and actually a little more personal, but nevertheless with a, a message. As you and I have discussed in person, we, bo we both have histories in Manchester, yours in New Hampshire and mine in England. And as I love to remind you, we're the home of the greatest soccer teams on earth. And I noticed, though, that around Manchester, um, and I do have family, as you probably know, in, in Massachusetts, uh, there is a Cardinal de Croix Academy in your Manchester. And this must be a great honor, but more especially, it reminds us about the formation of young people in the faith. How do you see the next generation of Catholic youth using the Bible in their own lives, but more especially, how do you see them sort of developing and growing in, in their overall faith? Hmm. That, my brother, is one of the greatest challenges before us at this time in our history, here in Quebec, in a special way. As you know, we have very few Catholic schools. Uh, most have public schools. And uh, we have to find a way to walk with these young people, whether they be children or teenagers or young adults. And uh, all our catechesis, all our accompaniment, uh, whether it be uh, preparation for the sacraments or preparation just for Christian living, growth in Christian life, formation to Christian life, all of them include working with the with Holy Scripture. From the first years, we we we, we share the gospel. We bring them. Uh, we help them discover through history of salvation, uh, Abraham, Moses, and all the creation and uh, the prophets and bring them to the gospel, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul, all of that slowly. But we found out that it's, we've discovered and we're discovering more and more that for this to be fruitful, we cannot just work with children. We need to work children and parents. We do that now in a family sitting, in a family setting. Because if, if the children are sent to catechism or they're sent to prepare for a sacrament or they're sent for a catechism or whatever, and their parents are not involved, it's like sending your kids to hockey or, or, or to football or soccer and you just leave them there for practice, you go back home. They have, uh, they have uh, games, you don't even go. The kids are going to be discouraged. This isn't worth it. Parents are always there whether it be for sports, whether it be for gymnastics, whether it be for ballet, for choirs, for music, they're there and they're, you know, rooting for them. And that's an encouragement they need. And that's what we're doing now. It's been quite a conversion because before all of this was done in schools. But now that we don't have that anymore, and a lot of people are not churchgoers, so the family automatically does not transmit their faith because they've been away from it for quite a while. So we take advantage of when they knock at our door for baptism, for first uh, sacrament of reconciliation, Holy Eucharist, confirmation, marriages. Well, we invite them to, uh, to do this as a family and we take time. 
And we often start by exactly sharing the word of God with them. They are amazed at what they discover in this. Wow, this is really in, in the Bible. And wow, this speaks to me. Yeah, and there's a lot more. And with that, we start sharing on, you know, we choose the texts that go with what they're, what the stage they're at. So what we tend to do right now is in one room, we'll have all the children and we give them a cate catechism, uh, uh, their, their evangelization or, 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 or the, the catechist will explain things with the word of God at their level, at their age. And in another room, we'll give the same theme with the same biblical text, but on an adult level so that when they're done, they can come together and share about the same experience. We don't talk to the parents as they were kids, and we don't talk to the kids as they were parents. They, they're on two different levels. Intellectually, this is important for the parents because, you know, faith and the sacraments is just not a thing for kids. It's not just to get a diploma, to get a, a certificate. Well, we're done with that. Now let's move on. No, this is a way of life. So this is a very long process. It's the conversion has been difficult because a lot of parents, you know, have been used to, well, we send them to the nuns and they'll prepare them. We'll send them to the parish and they have specialists who do, you know, uh, the catechism and the catechist and they'll prepare them. We need much more than that. We need the parents to be involved, you know. And I, I relate to that because I saw what it was in my family, the fact that my parents were so involved in the faith and they weren't fanatics and they weren't, you know, bouncing off walls and uh, they were normal people, you know, normal people, but they had the Lord in their lives and they never pushed us or obliged us, but they gave us the desire to follow in that pathway. So that's what we're trying to do. Of course, we have less people than before because it's not an automatic thing. Oh, you're in second grade, time for this, this step. Okay, you're in sixth grade, now it's confirmation. No, that's not how it works. And so we wait and, uh, and that is helping to build really beautiful Christian families and it's helping people. We have more and more adults now. This year, I think I confirmed, we confirmed over 500 adults uh, in, in, in a sacrament of confirmation that had been away since their first communion. But now they're waking up. They, 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 they're having an experience. They're meeting somebody. They're living a passage in their life, and they, they want to, to go further. So we accompany them. It's a way of, it's like a catechumenate, you know, a, a program where for months and months and months they meet with others, and they have witnessing, they have sharing of the word, they have teachings. And, and it helps them grow. So that's what, that's the key today. That's how we're working. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to see that this is bearing fruit, but it's a long process. Taking a minute out of the conversation here to tell you about the Bible course, because whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or you're just starting on your journey, the Bible course offers a superb overview of the world's best selling book. This is an eight session course that will help you grow in your understanding of the Bible. It uses a unique storyline and the Bible course shows you how key events, books and characters all fit together. It's great for in-person groups or it can be used for digital gatherings. It can really be used anywhere. You can watch the first session for free and review the accompanying course guide. Go to biblecourse.ca to learn more. That's biblecourse.ca. Now back to the conversation. It, I mean, there is, I mean, there's a shift in the locus really of, 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 of the catechetical ministry really from sort of in a sense, always beginning with the institutional church and then moving to the families, but the families also now being very much part of the center. And I think we're finding that your eminence, not only within the Roman Catholic tradition, we're finding it in many others as well. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. At the, at the gathering of the Canadian Council of Churches in Quebec City uh, that I was privileged to attend in May, if you'll recall, you addressed the leadership and you gave a really inspiring message, I have to say. It kind of was like fervent sermon, I thought. And you emphasized there the ecumenical nature of the church, but also the call to evangelize our world with the good news. And it came to all of us very clearly. How can denominations now work together to promote the faith 
And what are the challenges and the joys of such an enterprise? Because I see it as mm. being a vital part and ingredient of the life of the church going forward. Uh, your sort of views on that a little bit, Your Eminence. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, all of us disciples of the Lord Jesus, all of us who believe in the gospel and live and try to live by the gospel, have heard and read and preach so often on Jesus's prayer that all may be one. Unity is God's greatest desire. And uh, we're not living up to that right now. And we need to attend that and work on that. And I have found a lot of comfort and a lot of joy with my sisters and brothers here in, in my region of Quebec. Uh, we meet every year, all the pastors, before Christmas, I welcome them to my residence. We have a we have a uh, uh, a big breakfast uh, with bacon and eggs and everything else, and then we have a second course. Everybody brings their Bible, and we share the Word of God in December, early December, usually. And it's beautiful to see how the Word of God brings us together and how we want to grow. And I've seen over the years, I've been doing this now for 12 years, every year, except for the COVID years, we couldn't do that. At first, the other denominations, the other communities were a little reluctant. Why is the Archbishop, the Roman Catholic Archbishop, inviting us to his house? And what does he want to tell us? What, what is he want to bring us into something? No, just uh, we're brothers and sisters. We serve the mission of the church here in this area of, of this great region of Quebec City, and uh, uh, let's get to know each other and and help each other out. So we, we have that double course breakfast, and then we share, okay, in a few weeks it's Christmas. How are you preparing? What are you doing to bring people to the Lord for this Christmas? How? What kind of a Christmas, and how are you reaching out? And wow, I hadn't, that's a great idea. I haven't heard about that. Let's do that. We could do this together. So that is something, and I believe in that. And now we have such beautiful relationships, really, a lot of respect. Not, we're not afraid of each other and uh, don't step on my toes and uh, let, let's not get to argue and punches. No, not at all. It's beautiful how we respect the diversity. We're not all on the same page on every issue, but on the biggest and most important things, yes, we are. The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus, our Savior, we believe in the gospel, we believe in his message, we believe in the word of God, and we believe that he is living in our midst, we believe in the Paschal mystery, and that unites us, and that is a strength we need to continue to share. Of course, we don't go into the more difficult subjects because that's not the point of it at this time. There are commissions in most of our churches, and we work uh, for ecumenism, like you say, and uh, uh, I, I know the Roman Catholic Church on a local level, on a, on a Canadian level, on an international level. There's a lot of dialogues with different churches, and we're moving along. Last week, I was in Rome with the Holy Father. And uh, on June 29th is always the Feast of St. Peter's and Paul. And we had a representative from the Orthodox Church come and uh, pray with us. And uh, we prayed with him. And uh, we continue to strive for unity. Uh, this is a scandal that we disciples of Jesus are still divided after 2000 years. We need to find a way to, and I think these are little things we're doing. Uh, Holy Week also now, we're doing a beautiful thing on, on, uh, on the evening of Good Friday. We have uh, four Christian churches in old Quebec here in the walls of old Quebec. And we, uh, we proclaim the, the passion of, of our Lord in the Gospel of John every uh, Good Friday evening. We start in the United Church, and there are a few hymns of their tradition. Uh, the pastor welcomes us with a few words, a prayer, and then we read one-fourth of the, the Gospel, the, uh, the passion uh, of our Lord. And then we walk with the cross, a wooden cross in the streets of Old Quebec, to the Presbyterian Church in silence, and then we come to that church, a few hymns from their part in the same scenario, welcomed by the pastor and, 
and the, it keeps growing. Then we come to the Roman Catholic Cathedral. I say a few words. We pray together. We sing, read the third part of the Passion, and then we finish off at the uh, Holy Trinity, the Anglican Cathedral, and with the same scenario, and we finish in silence at the foot of the cross, usually as four pastors come together, holding each other, praying for each other, and then the people come and do the same, and we leave and go home. That is a very powerful sign that does not need many words, and that helps us grow. I believe that, you know. I, I think I so. That. Very, very much so. And, and you know, uh, we did, as, as you probably wear, something very similar in Toronto with the crosswalk. And yeah. we were at your own church's Our Lady of Perpetual Help and Holy Rosary. And we ended at my church, Timothy Eaton. And those are, are the most moving parts of the whole yes. of the Easter liturgy for me. And uh, and to see, you know, a lot of people from various backgrounds coming together. It's also, uh, I'll be honest with you, Your Eminence, one of the things that I love so much about being with the Canadian Bible Society, because from my purview, I've been able to travel and to preach in, in so many different denominations and mm. to witness the vibrancy of worship and the sincerity and the faithfulness and the Christ-centeredness of so yes. many of the confessions, right? And, and it really mm. does in, in, inspire the soul. On, on, a, on, a, on a negative note for a moment though, just, just because I know that there are many people who, you know, are worried about and, and events uh, with the church in general and the Roman Catholic church in particular over the past few years, and we're all aware of what they are. And they're painful, uh, particularly the relationship with our indigenous uh, communities. Mm. Um, and as you know, the Bible Society has been at the forefront of trying to help with healing with our translations of the Bible into indigenous languages and bringing people together. How do you think the Bible helps us recover a sense of an authentic mission in the midst of these challenges and helps us sort of heal and restore broken relationships. As we uh, read and pray with the gospel, we see Jesus in action. We see what's in his heart and how he walks with his apostles, his disciples, and trains them to have this openness, this open heart, these open relationships with everyone. He will bring them to pagan lands on the other side of the Sea of Galilee where nobody goes, he brought them there after, after the storm on the Lake of Galilee, he brings them there to go evangelize there because the, the savior of the world is also for them. He brings them all the way down to Jericho, the lowest city on earth. He comes in the deepest part of our needs, of our, of our suffering to meet Zacchaeus and to open mercy to him. He brings them to the Samaritan woman. He brings them, he deals with everybody, the, the Roman centurion. Reading the gospel opens up our hearts to be able to see the world differently, to see people differently. And it changes our attitudes. It's changed mine in many ways and continues to challenge me a lot. Uh, some of my attitudes, if they were not, uh, uh, adjusted or in the works of being adjusted because I'm not there yet uh, with the gospel I'd be a pretty mean creature if I were less left to myself I could be you know very racist or very closed and, and very but the gospel opens me up it opens us up it opens our congregations our communities our families and that's why reading and, and, and feeding on the word of God, we learn to love everybody. We are all brothers and sisters. And Jesus teaches us that, yeah. So I think the word of God has a very important part. You know, and, and I like what the Bible Society does. It doesn't just spread out Bibles and sell and give Bibles, which is a great thing to do, but your little leaflets on themes, the little leaflets, the little books, they're very precious. We use them all the time here in our cathedral with groups of pilgrims. We have different texts on a theme and we share the, that with people and uh, help them pray. And then they put it in their pocket and bring it home. 
Well, you've got a seed there that's going to produce some fruits. Isn't that beautiful? It, it works. So the word of God, you, you know, not everybody is at ease to go around with the Bible under his arm like this. But there are many ways to, to pray with the word of God and, and to use it. And come a time where you're proud to work, work with the Bible and, and have it in your hands and have your own Bible and be able to underline if you want or special places. And uh, I like to write dates Oh, this, this, this touched me at this such a date. And I was there. The Lord met me there. Because the word of God in Christianity is foremost and above all a relationship, an experience of a relationship with someone. It's an encounter. It's not a book of history, although there's a lot of history. It's not a book of stories, although there are a lot of stories. It's the revelation of a God who so loved the world that he created it for us. And when it was broken and when it was going to the, not in a good situation, he so loved the world that he sent his only son to reveal that love, that mercy, so that we could have life and have it abundantly. So that's the love. That's the, the, the love of God that we encounter, when you encounter that or are encountered by that love, it changes you. And then everything else can fall into place. We don't start by uh, moralizing people. We want to evangelize first, bring them the gospel, and then their life will start to change and turn. Just as it happened with Zacchaeus, as it happened with the Samaritan and with so many others, and many others in the past 2,000 years. The Lord, bring it, coming to the Lord, as sinners, as people who are sometimes all crooked, will help you discover that you are loved. Like Pastor Rick Warren wrote once in one of his books, I say that all the time, God loves you just as you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He loves you just as you are. Don't get it wrong. He loves you. He knows everything about you, but he loves you, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be free, happier. He wants you to be, to, to bloom, to, to be a saint. Let him do it. When you feel love, you have that trust in God, in Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, to the Father, to allow him to change your life. And I think that's, that's the heart of it. That's the heart. Really, it really, it really is, Your Eminence. I mean, we have in the Bible Society now what they call a recovery Bible, and it's for those who really have found themselves at the depths. And you've already articulated how Jesus went to the depths. But I remember years ago, um, our church sponsored probably the largest AA group in, in Toronto. And, uh, and, and after letting the Bible be there for people to read and to see, there was one young man who came up to me and he said, you know, the Bible understands me. And I said, well, that's okay. That's great. What do you mean? And he'd read that incredible passage, you know, from out of the depths of, I cried unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice and let thine ears be attentive to the prayers of my heart. I mean, let yeah. him hear me. And it changed him. And it, it, you know, and it continues to change it. Finally, how, how can we help you? I mean, you are always in a giving ministry. Yours is one that, that exudes sort of a love and a passion for others. But how can our, our listeners to this podcast and viewers, how can the Canadian Bible Society, how can we pray for you? And what would you like us to prioritize in terms of our prayers to the Holy Spirit for you? Hmm. Well, who am I to ask you and to tell you what I need? But, I, but let me tell you, uh, let's keep praying for each other and let's, let's celebrate and be proud of what the Lord is doing in our midst. You know, I, uh, when I welcomed you last October here in Quebec, I was just marveled. My prayer, my heart was filled with a prayer of thanksgiving, of gratitude. Wow, it's beautiful to see what he's doing in your life and, and what you're doing for him. Your loving response, because you feel love, you've encountered him. He is alive in your life, and you want to share that, you know? Yeah. Well, what, how does St. Paul put it in, in 
uh, in French, it's malheur à moi si je n'évangélise pas. Well, how would you say that in, in English? Woe to me if I do not evangelize? Uh, something like that, yes, yes. Something yes. like that. Yeah, woe to me if I've I don't share myself. the news. Yes, yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've allowed myself to change the wording of St. Paul. It's kind of pretentious, but I did. <laughs> Instead of saying, you know, woe to me if I do not, I say, what joy when I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Excellent. And uh, I rejoice every time I meet a sister or brother, whether it be a pastor or a lay person, a consecrated person who, who is in love with the Lord, rejoice and I pray for them. Let's continue to pray for each other. And, and, and for you in your work in the Bible Society, continue to have that creativity to share in so many ways the word, the living word of God with people in the languages of our country and all over the world. I mean, there's the Bible continues to be translated and brought to people and, 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 and tools. You have great tools to help people from little children to adults, to specialists, to people who are opening for the first time. You're talking about the recovery Bible. I saw a Bible that you did a few years ago on social teaching, right? On, on passages that talk about the poor, the needs and, and uh, underline uh, uh, my good friend, Pierre Terrien, who was <laughs> in the Bible society here in Quebec for years and years. I've known Pierre for uh, maybe 40 years. I was honored when his wife, uh, Pierre asked me to, to preside his funeral. Uh, he was a man who loved the Lord, who had an ecumenical heart, and who did all he could to share. And I, through him, I saw the beautiful work you're doing. I'm proud to say that in our city, we have a, we have a store of the Bible yeah, Society. Yeah, you do, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not in a little suburb in a back alley. It's right on the Rue Saint-Jean, which is exactly. one of the most touristic and passing streets in the, in, in the city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's great is. food on that street. You know, there's great, great food on that street. There is. There's but great ice cream and there's yeah, a great this, pub. This is and, great food too. And the, uh, yeah, you beat me to it. <laughs> I beat you to it. The great food that you're offering people. And, and it's right there on Main Street, you know, so people yeah. stop by and look and find something. You know, they're little, <laughs> the little prayer cards with the, with, with the excerpts of the Bible. You have... Uh, little notebooks. There's so many things that you've been so creative. Thank you. Let's pray that we can continue to share God's word and uh, let's continue to be in that fraternal relationship. We need each other. We do. You indeed. know, I'm incomplete. Yeah. I'm incomplete. I'm not very sad to say that. And uh, if you allow me to say it, you're incomplete that and everyone's means. incomplete. No one can say I have it all. We need each other. We do. That is part of of not just uh, an act of humility, it's the truth. We need each other to continue growing. Jesus sent us out to preach the word and to teach, and he sent us together. He didn't tell that to one or to the other. He said that to everyone. We need to continue to do that. Uh, in, in October this year, we will have a plenary session of the Synod of Bishops. The word of God will have a very prominent place in that. And we will have a very important ecumenical uh, delegation, as we always do, but I think it'll be more important this year. We'll have almost one quarter, almost 25% of the Synod of Bishops will not be bishops. They'll be lay people. They'll be men and women equally. And they'll be uh, priests also, consecrated deacons, uh, so that together we can continue to see how we how we are living our Christian life and how we can better share it in witnesses to the world. So, and, and pray that, please, if, you, if I can have, ask you for a personal, a personal prayer for me, it would be this. Pray that the fire of God's love in my heart never fail and that my response to him be ever more generous and faithful. God's love, I know, will never fail, but being who I am, I don't want to fail him. And I do sometimes. I'm not as generous as I should be. I'm not as faithful. I'm not as open as I should be. I'm, I'm a work in progress candidate, you know. I'm working and the Lord is working in me. But uh, uh, 
pray that I be faithful. And you have accomplish what the Lord. God, Neil, you have our commitment that we'll do that. And and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your candor, your love, your warmth, uh, your passion for the Lord. And we will continue to pray for your work. And as you said, you will pray for ours. And uh, may God bless you uh, richly until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sterling. God bless you. Mm-hmm.